Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a very interesting series on themes in the Gospel of John. Themes. Hmm. This is lesson number two in that series entitled Signs of Divinity. It's a lesson for October 12 of 2024. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we study this very significant gospel record that John wrote so many years ago, help us to see the important points and understand how they are a clues and signs of the fact that Jesus was and was himself God in human form. Help us to see those that picture clearly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you believe that Jesus was divine? I'm going to take that one on. Yes. Do you, do, you believe, do you believe he was fully God and yet fully human? And the Christian church has argued about that point, went on arguing about it for year, hundreds of years, literally. There have been wars over that. Yeah. Okay, Jim? The Bible study guide. The Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son, one with the Father, underived and uncreated. Jesus is the one who created all that was made, first, excuse me, John 1, 1 to 3. Thus, Jesus has always existed. There never was a time when he did not exist. Though Jesus came to this world and took upon himself our humanity, he always kept his divinity and at specific times Jesus said and did things that revealed the divinity from the Bible study guide. Okay, can you lead us to that, Larry? Okay, in John 1 verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. From the very beginning was uh, the the Word was with God. Through him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. That's from the American Bible Society. Okay. What are the most convincing evidences that, to you that Jesus was divine while he was here on this earth? I think we could read people's minds, their motives. Okay. To predict things. This has so, been a very challenging. Uh, go ahead. I predicted, uh, and not just things, but moral choices. Mm -hmm. So, so Peter's uh, decision, uh, Judas's decision. So those would be some things that come to mind for okay. me. Okay, in this lesson, we're going to look at three major miracles: the feeding of the five thousand. That's men, of course, not counting women and children. So there may have been twenty thousand. Two, the healing of the man born blind. And three, the resurrection of Lazarus. Those are pretty major issues. Uh, Lorna? From the Bible Study Guide, this lesson looks at three of the greatest signs of Jesus' divinity. What is striking is that in every case, some people did not believe the miracle or perceive its significance. For some, it was a time of turning away from Jesus. For others, a time of deepening blindness, and for others, a time to plot Jesus' death, and for others, a time to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Wow, from our Bible study guide. The first of three main miracles that we will consider in this lesson is the feeding of the 5,000. And that story is told in quite a bit of detail in John 6, 1 to 15. The story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So we'll pick out a few verses there just to get us it started. Mickey? The time for the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked around and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. So he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? Why do you think he asked Philip? Why do you think he asked the question? So he, why did why, he choose why Philip? Why did he even have to ask? Yeah. He, well, I think he was know. testing the disciples. Yeah, probably. How creative and how, you know, believing they were of his ability to handle this. Why did he pick on Philip? 
No, that was my question. Who was closest? So, he was probably closest by. That's possible. Maybe he realized that Philip was. Yeah. They should ask Thomas. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay, what were the consequences of this miraculous feeding, Myra? Well, from John 6, verses 14 to 15, and 26 to 36. Seeing this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, that Jesus had performed, the people there said, Surely this is the prophet who, has, who was to come into the world. Jesus knew that what they, that they were uh, knew that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force. So he went off again to the hills by himself. Wow. Jesus, Jesus answered, I'm telling you the truth. You are looking for me because you ate the bread and had all that you wanted, not because you understood my miracles. Do not work for food that, de that goes bad. Instead, work for food that lasts for eternal life. This is the food which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has put his mark of approval on, on him. So they asked him, what can we do in order in order to do what God wants us to do. What were they thinking there, of course? They're thinking, hmm, Moses fed us for 40 years. Can't you sort of... <laughs> yeah, fix this. I bet if you feed our armies so that we can go yeah. into battle and defeat the Romans. Exactly. And heal the wounded. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Jesus answered, what God wants you to do is to believe in the one he sent. They replied, what miracle will you perform so that we may see it and believe you? What did he, had he just done? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert. We can give you a suggestion as, here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just as the scripture says, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I'm telling you the truth, Jesus said. What Moses gave you was not the bread from heaven. It was my Father who gives you the real bread from heaven. The bread that God gives is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they asked Him, give us this bread always. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. Now I... T I told you that I told you that you have seen me but will not believe okay and that's the problem I I think of, I, I, I'm always trying to put myself in imagination in that situation you know do you think that the food that they ate was just exactly like what they ate every day, or do you think it was something special about it? Yeah. Just what they ate every day. Loaves well, and well, fish. Loaves and fishes, yeah. Yeah. There was probably something extra good to it. Well, the manna they didn't was believe. definitely different. Yeah. What do you think the people understood Jesus to be saying in John 6, 35? There... As we said before, I think, would well, this group thought this, this group thought this, this group thought this, depending on where they were coming from. Okay, I mean, they Jesus wanted made, something different than what? Jesus made this statement, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. And No, no idea. W weren't they looking back at Moses 40 years of manna? What, what is this? Yeah. And manna was something wonderful. I won't ever be thirsty. Yeah. And, and it came every day, you know, except Sabbath. And so it, it, it fed yeah. them. You know, they were exactly. really never, they didn't have to work to grow grain. It was just out there on the bushes and they harvested it. Wow. Jesus needed to make very specific, pointed comments about why he came and what he intended to accomplish. 
when understood correctly, the seven I am statements in John, including in John 6, are clear evidence of that. However, the people who were determined to take Jesus by force to make him their political ruler missed all of this. You know that there's these statements, we, have, we don't have time to go through all of them, but I am the bread, I am the gate, I am the life, I am the resurrection, I am the, you know, okay. From the Bible Study Guide, it is reasonable to think of Moses as a type of Jesus. Moses and Jesus are similar in their mission of delivering people from bondage, for example. Of all biblical characters, Moses comes closest to Jesus in his ministry of intercession. Interesting. Yeah. That's an opinion. After Israel in the wilderness, this is from the Bible Study Guide. Yeah. After Israel in the wilderness rebelled against God in worshiping the golden calf, Moses offered to die in their place to be their substitute. In Exodus 32, 32, we read the moving account of Moses pleading with God to spare the lives of his, relig of his rebellious people. Moses speaks to God saying, quote, yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written from the New King James Version. And I am, I just, every, every time I read that, I'm wondering, what was Moses thinking? What did he, did he really think that somehow or other, do you think that if God took his life, he could, he could save all the Israelites? As a substitution? We, we, we know that can't be. Uh, at least he was free to talk to God, wouldn't he? Yeah, well, I, I, that's a good thing. Well, people believe that Jesus is, many people believe that Jesus is a substitute for all of us sinners. Yeah. So, but did you know, Moses, what evidence did Moses have for that? He was a little ways back in history. You know? Maybe he thought <laughs> s similarly. Well, the, the idea of somebody coming and dying for something, it has a long history, far before, uh, that's why the, uh, uh, human sacrifices. Yeah. And so, I mean, that, that, there are many precursors to Jesus' death. Maxwell used to mention those years yeah. ago, you know, he said, dying and rising saviors. In fact, I have a book called, uh, done back in the 19th century about the 16 dying and rising saviors. It's quite, it's quite interesting. The, yeah. Anyway. Well, Moses was indeed a self-sacrificing leader, and we, you know, we need to recognize that. I mean, that statement is pretty amazing. Moses' self-sacrificing devotedness to his wayward people and his plea to die in the place of others is admirable. But such a gracious offer cannot forgive sin and commute his penalty, death, for only the sacrifice of the divine prophet. Um, hold on. The divine prophet Jesus can accomplish such an impossible feat. Jesus alone is the one who possesses the requisite righteousness and life to exchange for our sin and death. So now, some of you already recognize there's gonna be a big, some big questions here. How does the life and death of Jesus, quote, forgive sin and commute his penalty, death? Was his death a payment to the Father to assuage the Father's wrath? Where did that, who made that uh, statement up? Well, the language, uh, the language is there. The so language is from the Bible study guide. That's where we're quoting it from. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, there are those words in the Bible, too. So yeah, I but, think it, so it also depends on the level of moral development and stage of faith that you're yes. at. So when you deal with kids, you sometimes have to use <clears throat> language that is uh, forensic and legal and punishment oriented and reward oriented. And then as people get more mature, then you can not use that paradigm, but then talk about the relationship. Language. That kind of goes back to Maxwell's use of the word wrath, mm -hmm. that the wrath in that time was, how can I give you up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at the parallels between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. Did these events in Jesus' life remind the people of Israel about the deliverance of their ancestors from Egypt? Um, no, that's yours, Jim. Numerous details of this story place Jesus in parallel to Moses in the Exodus. The time of the Passover in John 6, 4 points to the greater, great deliverance from Egypt. Jesus goes up on a mountain, John 6, 3, as Moses went up Sinai. Jesus tests Philip, John 6, 
flies in verses 5 and 6, as the Israelites were tested in the wilderness. The multiplication of the loaves, John 6, 11, is reminiscent of manna, of the manna. The gathering of the leftover food, John 6, 12, harks back to the Israelites gathering the manna. Twelve baskets of leftover are picked up, John 6, 13, the same number as the twelve tribes of Israel. And the people comment that Jesus is the prophet among Give me, prophet coming into the world, John 6, 14, parallel to the prophet like Moses predicted in Deuteronomy 18, 15. All of this points to Jesus as the new Moses, come to deliver his people from the Bible study guide. Yes, but from a different kind of deliverance than what they were looking for. <laughs> yeah. For sure. The Jewish people had been waiting for more than 400 years for a prophet to come that would be like Moses. Obviously, no one has done that yet. So, Larry? Yeah, from the writings of Ellen White. Uh, but the people did not choose to receive the statement of divine truth. Jesus had done the very work which prophecy had foretold that the Messiah would do. But they had not witnessed what their selfish hopes had pictured his, as his work. Christ had indeed once fed the multitude with barley loaves. But in the days of Moses, Israel had been fed the manna 40 years, and far greater blessings were expected from the Messiah. Their dissatisfied hearts queried, why? If Jesus could perform so many wondrous works as they had witnessed, could he not give health, strength, and riches to all his people, free them from their oppressors, and exalt them to power and honor. The fact that he claimed to be the sent of God and yet refused to be Israel's king was a mystery which they could not fathom. His refusal was misinterpreted. Many circulated, concluded that he dared not assert his claims because he himself doubted as to the divine nature of his mission. Thus they up opened their hearts to unbelief, and the seed which Satan had sown bore fruit in its kind, its misunderstanding and defection from the Dire of Ages, page eight, 385. And it's interesting that if you look, go back and look at the history, it caused up so much stir as a result of that conflict. Jesus had to take his disciples out of Galilee when, that was a point at which he went over off to Tyre and Sidon uh, because it, it was just so too much. So that very day, Jesus had to send the disciples away mm -hmm. and Jesus had to leave and send the people away uh, and if so, you, so that he, they, they didn't crown him king. Yeah. And if you read the chapter on Judas and the writings of Ellen White, Judas was one of the main ones that said, okay, now's the time. And I want to be part of this kingdom. Well, part yeah. of the betrayal was to force Jesus' hand yes. to reveal himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we should not fault the Jewish people too much because it's very clear that if Jesus had chosen to become an earthly king, he would have been the most fantastic general and king to conquer the Romans because of his ability not only to defeat the troops, but also to heal anyone who was injured. The people were beginning to recognize that, and they were determined to force him, if necessary, to become their king. However, Jesus came with a very different mission. There were a number of parallels between the Passover and the details of this miracle. They both occurred at Passover time. Passover was a comm commemoration of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. Jesus himself was the true Passover lamb. The lamb died in place of the firstborn. Jesus died to teach us the truth about sin and its results. Thus he died the death that we should have to die as a result of our sins, Romans 6, 23. How many of the Jewish people, including the Jewish leaders, saw the miracles of Christ and recognized that they were a fulfillment of prophecies from the Old Testament? I mean, remember, yeah, that's these are a good question. A number <laughs> close yeah. to zero. Yeah. <laughs> These are the people who had memorized the Old Testament. That doesn't mean that they made the connection. Yeah, they just memorized. That was just it. They just memorized. Memory it. doesn't. Yeah, they just. I mean, you must. If you sit down and 
repeat something enough times so that you memorize it. I memorized the book of Romans once. I memorized the book of, of James once. I, you've, got to, you've got to think about what you're doing, at least something. Yeah, yeah mm. but if you start down the wrong path with it. Yeah. It's so just, much easier. Here's, Paul, here's, Paul, Saul slash Paul had memorized yeah. probably all of the, what we call the Old Testament. Yeah. And it took him how many years to rearrange his paradigm after the Damascus Road? Thirteen was it? Or? Three, at least three. three yeah. yeah. It is so much easier. Here's the problem: to hope for material blessings to add to one's life, instead of thinking that a complete change needs to be made in one's paradigm. <clears throat> wow. Let's turn next to the healing of the man born blind. Larry, is that yours? Lorna. No, Lorna's. Lorna. I'm sorry. John 9, 1 to 16. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. His disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? Jesus answered, His blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. He is blind so that the power, so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is day, we must keep on doing the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud. With the spittle, he rubbed the mud on the man's eyes and he said, go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This name means sent. So the man went, washed his face and came back seeing. His neighbors then, and the people who had seen him begging before, asked, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, He is the one. But others said, No, he isn't. He just looks like him. So the man himself said, I am the man. How is it that you can see now? They asked him. He answered, The man called Jesus made some mud, rubbed it on my eyes, and told me to go to Siloam and wash my face. So I went, and as soon as I washed, I could see. Where is he? They asked. I don't know, he answered. The so, so guess what happens next? <laughs> the hunt is on. The Pharisees investigate the healing. They, then they took him to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. The day that Jesus made the mud and cured him of his blindness was a Sabbath. Oh dear. <laughs> the Pharisees then asked the man again how he had received his sight. He told them he put some mud on my eyes. I wash my face and now I can see. Let me interrupt for just a second. The pool of Siloam was a large, large pool. And it was located just outside in one of the main entrances to the temple complex. And everybody who went into the temple complex was expected to go through ritual washing uh, to that pool. And so, you know, it was recognized as almost like a gateway to the temple. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's someone who's got a problem. He probably wasn't allowed into the temple complex because of his disability. Now he is washed, he can see, and now he can enter the, the temple. Now was there some, I remember reading somewhere, like, like when Jesus spit on the dirt and then put it on his eyes, was there some other significance to this yes. act that there's some healing properties in spit or whatever. Well, they believed that there were some healing properties to spit, and yeah, there sort of some. Um, the challenge here was that there's a if you look at all those rules about what you can and can't do on the Sabbath. First of all, you under certain circumstances you can put something, you could do something below the neck, but not above the neck. On the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. And you can, you can do certain things to heal people, but you can't mix a, a preparation and put it on. And so, I mean, so Jesus... He, he's making, so he's doing this purposely yeah. to get them going. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He's stirring the pot, huh? He's getting them to think. Because of these hundreds and hundreds of yeah. these rules. Right? Yes, oh yeah, hundreds of them, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Some of the Pharisees said, the man who did this cannot be from God, for he does not obey the Sabbath law. Others, however, 
said, how could a man who is a sinner perform such miracles as these? There was a division among them. That's, That's a problem. <laughs> That's a real problem. The Jewish people in general had the idea, partially based on experiences told in the Old Testament, that disease is a direct result of a person's own or his parents' sins. And Exodus 20, verse 5, 2 Kings 5, 17, 15 to 17, there's several places there that sort of hint that idea. The complete story of Job should have clarified these issues for them. However, it apparently did not. In the case of the man born blind, is it possible that God caused him to be born blind so Jesus could perform this miracle? I don't think so. We're, we're, we're uncomfortable with that idea, aren't we? Well, if you have any understanding, uh, what a, a good concept of God's character, you wouldn't apply it that way. Yeah. This man had years and years of misery being blind. Yeah. Yeah, that goes back to our concept of God would cause that. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was a big, long discussion that we don't have time to read in John 9, first of all, about what actually happened then, a big discussion between Jesus and the Pharisees about what it meant. You got John 9, 1 to 41, but they left out verse uh, 39. No, it goes... Verse 9, 39. I think it's a very important for it because it explains... Well, 39 comes before 41. It's 1 dash 41. Yeah, 9, verse 9, 39. No. Yes. It's, it's included. It's included. I understand, but it doesn't have the text quoted. Oh, well, because it's a couple of two, three pages worth. Well, okay, so just take a look at uh, nine, John 9, 39. Well, okay. We can do that. You wonder why Jesus came here 2,000 years ago? I came to this world to judge so that the blind should see and those who see no. should become blind. That's the, the uh, Good News translation. I, for this reason I came for judgment. Mm -hmm. Now who's doing, God isn't judging anybody. It's so that you can listen to, for Mary said, you've heard uh -huh. it said in Matthew 5, right? Yeah. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. This is so that you can get another, another perspective on things. Well, he, he's already pointed that out, uh, what the issue was back in John 3, when he said, okay, if you believe, this is what happens. If you don't believe, this is what happens. So, um, okay, we notice that the details of what happened are discussed briefly in John 9, 1 through 12, while the investigation by the Pharisees with the issues it raises between Pharisees and Jesus take up the whole rest of the chapter. So, where are we? Mickey. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, miracle stories follow a common pattern, an expression of the problem, the bringing of the individual to Jesus, the cure, and recognition of the cure with praise to God. In the story in John 9, the sequence is completed in John 9, 7. But typical of John, the significance of the miracle becomes the much wider point of discussion leading to a long interaction between the healed man and the religious leaders. The striking discussion revolves around two intertwined, contrasting pairs of concepts, sin and works of God and blindness and sight. Okay, so can God heal someone who is, was born blind? He just did. Yeah, I was gonna say, he just did. <laughs> yeah. Since this miracle occurred on the Sabbath, was what Jesus did on this occasion a violation of Scripture in the Old Testament? <clears throat> Absolutely not. However, Jesus' actions were in contradiction to their traditions, and they were very happy to call him a Sabbath breaker. Many believed that proved that he was not from God. This, quote, Sabbath breaking, however, caused a big problem among the Pharisees themselves because while some wanted to follow the teachings of their traditions, Others realized that someone who, who could heal a man born blind certainly not, could not be a sinner. <laughs> I mean, you know, at, at the Sanhedrin, there must have been some hot discussions on that one. Why is it so much harder to give up old established beliefs than it is to accept new beliefs that agree with our current paragraph, uh, that disagree, I'm sorry, with our current paradigm? From the Bible Study Guide, a curious reversal occurs. The blind man comes to see more and more. 
not just physically, but spiritually. He is growing in his appreciation for Jesus and believing more strongly in him. The Pharisees, in contrast, become more and more blind in their understanding. <laughs> First, being divided over Jesus in John 9, 16, and then not knowing where he came from, John 9, 29. Let me interrupt for, for a second. You almost think back to the Naaman and Gehazi, <laughs> the, the disease was yeah. <laughs> transferred over yeah. to, yeah. to a Gehazi. Reversal of yeah. roles. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, go ahead. Meanwhile, his re his recounting of this miracle gives John the opportunity to tell us who Jesus is. The theme of signs in John 9 intersects with several other themes of the, in the, the gospel. John reaffirms that Jesus is the light of the world, John 9, 5, compared with John 8, 12. The story also deals with Jesus' mysterious origin. Who is he? Where did he come from? What is his mission? These are all from John 9, 12, and 29 compared with John 1, 14. And let me just interrupt for a second. My, this fancy program I have here that we're using to, on the computer allows me to make connections to different things. And if you start looking through the Gospel of John, you find three or four things that to this verse and three or four things to that verse. It's yeah. so interconnected. Yeah. Okay, let's see, where was I? The figure. The story deals... The figure. Oh, the figure of Moses, who is referenced in previous miracle accounts, also appears in this chapter, John 9, 28 and 29, compared with John 5, 45, 46, John 6, 32. Finally, there is a theme of the response of the crowd. Some love darkness rather than light, while others respond in faith. Again, many chapters from John 9 comparing with John Okay. 1. Okay, Gordon? So, also from the Bible study guide, another place. Moreover, adding insult to injury, this poor blind man not only suffered physically, but he also suffered spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. The public perception was that those who were sick in society were suffering because of their own sins or the sins of their parents. The blind man was made to believe that not only others looked upon him as guilty, but God also looked upon him with disfavor. So probably it would be hard for him to go and worship even in a synagogue. He may not even be able to get in. Yeah. This misconception was also in the disciples' mind, hence their question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind in John 9, 2. In their desire to assign blame, they were akin to many well-meaning but mistaken Christians of today. In a similar fashion, Job's misguided friends attempted to place the blame on him for his terrible tragedy and sickness. Let us learn from their mistakes. Why not instead follow the example of Jesus in focusing on the solution and not the problem? He came to this world not to condemn, but to save. See John yep. 3, 17. And this is from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Yeah. And another spot, uh, there's some, I mean, this is a continuing ongoing story. How telling and ironic that the religious leaders, with their physical sight intact, stubbornly refuse to see the light that Christ shone all around them. Thus, they willfully shrouded themselves in deeper and deeper in spiritual darkness until their blindness to the true light was irreversible. By contrast, the blind man's openness to Christ's light not only enabled him to see physically with his eyes, but also enabled him to have the enlightened spiritual insight needed to recognize Jesus as the Son of God, who alone is worthy of worship. And I, if we had time, I'd love to go back and look through this, because here's this blind man instructing them. Oh, you yeah, know, right. Yeah. <laughs> you talk about <laughs> backwards. I was blind, but now I see. Yeah. I see, I see, says the blind man. Why don't we see these kinds of healings in our day? What methods does God want us to use in our day? Now, here we go. Jim? In the Savior's manner of healing, 
there were lessons for his disciples. On one occasion, he anointed the eyes of a blind man which, with clay and bade him go wash in this pool of Siloam. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came see. John 9, 7. The cure, cure could be wrought only by the power of the great healer, yet Christ made use of the simple agencies of nature. While he did not give countenance to the drug medication, he sanctioned the use of simple and natural remedies. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 428. Yeah, 824, I'm sorry. We don't even know what kind of crazy concoctions they might have been using in those days. Okay, anyway, Larry? Okay, also from the Desire of Ages, 823, from Ellen White. Jesus is just as willing to heal the sick now as when he was personally on earth. Christ's servants are his representatives, the channels for his working. He desires through them to exercise his healing power. It's very interesting to notice that Jesus turned the tables on the Pharisees. The one whom they claimed to be their leader, Moses, would accuse them for their misunderstanding of what really happened in Moses' day. Jesus criticized him in light of the fact that this man suddenly saw the light and followed Jesus while the religious leaders were burying themselves further and further in darkness. Compare that with what we read in John 3, 16 to 21. And this is the passage I, or idea. In fact, let's take a moment and just look at that. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge but to be its savior. Those who believe in the son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged. So you can kind of see what the issue is there because they have not believed in God's only son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want to, their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they d did was in obedience to God. So. I think all that's in Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus at night, yeah, isn't it? It is, yes. Okay, so, but what does that tell us, basically? It says those who choose to believe come to God, and those who choose not to believe run from Him. So they kind of judge themselves. Yeah, judge themselves, yeah. exactly. Well, it's like a hot potato. So yeah. God says, I'm not judging you. I gave it to my son. Yeah. And Jesus says, I'm not judging you. It's, it's the, the truth. The words yeah. I have spoken to you. And then the yeah. truth says, it's not me judging you. It's whether you come to me yeah. or not. You, you decide. Yeah. Yeah. Freedom. Okay, where are we? Lorna. Lorna. From the Bible study guide, so scary here is the spiritual blindness of the religious leaders. A once blind beggar can declare, since the world began, it has been unheard of <laughs> that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. I mean, what kind of a compelling argument is that? That's yeah, from John 9, 32 and 33. And yet the religious leaders, the spiritual guides of the nation, the ones who should have been the first to recognize Jesus and accept him as the Messiah, they, despite all the powerful evidence, cannot see it or they don't really want to see it. What a powerful warning about how our hearts can deceive us from the Bible study guide. And but, but his version, but their version of the Messiah was not what the real meaning of the Messiah was. Can you think of some other individuals mentioned in the Gospels who that had that kind of problem? Jesus told the disciples at least four times that we know about that he was going up to Jerusalem, he was going to be handed over to the Gentiles, he was going to be killed, but on the third day he would rise again, and whoosh, they you know, they right. did But he used did the word north. temple, mm -hmm. which I think might have, they thought on he, one he occasion could rebuild the temple in three days, so that I think that confused him as well. Yeah, but there, on the road up to Jericho, on that last time, he just says, 
exactly. This is exactly what's going to happen yeah. to me. And they're going, huh? Yeah. Couldn't be. It just couldn't possibly. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're going to take you up to Jerusalem. We're going to crown you king. Yeah, we, yeah, we want you to be around for and, a while. And they're going to all do it. Yeah. We, don't, we don't even have to do it. Yeah. But what a horrible thing for them to try to believe. Yeah. They're yeah. going to kill you? You're going to let them kill you? Yeah. Too impossible, yeah. too painful. Yeah, I mean, they, they recognize that Jesus certainly, surely could have prevented it if he wanted to. Oh, yeah. Well, this, I, you know, I mean, we've all had times when we've been very sure we were right about something. So that feeling that I know I'm right, and yet mm -hmm. we weren't, you know. Yeah. And yet there's other times we should trust the feeling if we're speaking the truth. So it's a, it's a tricky thing. You, can, yeah. you, you know, you have to always evaluate the feeling of what it's based on. My so, wife always thinks that I think I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> Rarely wrong. Well, but I'm wrong. I learned <laughs> in our first month of marriage that it was true that I was sure I was right, and I lost the bet, and he was right. <laughs> and he's, Thus he's played that card any, ever since. Yes. <laughs> he, he didn't have to do any more yard work after that. <laughs> Why do you think the Jewish religious leaders were so opposed to Jesus? <clears throat> think about the challenges for the disciples of Jesus. They had been brought up to believe that those religious leaders, religious teachers, had the truth. But now they were forced to watch Jesus in, all, in an all-out conflict with these religious leaders. What do we know about the background of these disciples that might help us to understand their situation? Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. Oh boy. They were men of native ability and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there are many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which have called into action would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I mean, think about this. Jesus is picking fishermen, and all they had basically done is learned how to fish. And he said, you, come with me. We're going we're gonna to transform the world. Plus, all, a, plus a tax collector and a few yeah, others. Yeah, yeah. And you're all going to end up being martyred. But it was it was an honor for quote a rabbi to ask somebody yep. to join them. That was an honor. Yeah. Like you said, only the best of the best of the best yep. who went through this grade school of memorizing the the Torah and then memorizing the whole Old Testament. It was only the the very superficial, the you know the, the top people the best who got the best, called yeah. by the rabbi to be their uh, accolades. Uh, I thought they had, so you and also Randy talked about it in a sermon, that they had to beg to be included in the particular well, school. Yeah. So, so did the rabbis ever ask somebody because of that? Well, that would be very unusual. Very, very unusual. Yeah. So, so the fact that they were called, then, of course, that right there maybe answers the question that when they were called, they took that as, wow, I'm yeah, being that, called. Yeah, that's why they said immediately. Yeah. I think that's the immediate part of that. Yeah. That, Here's this person that I would never expect to be called. I, had, I would have to beg. And since I didn't have to beg, they immediately followed. Wait. Responded, yeah. yeah. Took, jumped at the chance. Okay, now we're going to take the last few minutes we've got to talk about the raising of Lazarus. And I would like us all to, for a moment here to think, place ourselves in the position of Mary and Martha. They knew perfectly well that when Lazarus became sick, Jesus was perfectly capable of healing whatever was wrong with him. They knew that. They regarded Jesus as their very best friend. 
and they knew how much he loved Lazarus. So they could not understand why Jesus did not rush to their aid when Lazarus was sick. I mean, try to imagine, and you sit there and watch your brother die well, said, right in front of you. They said, if you'd have been here, if you'd have come, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. So they yeah. were sort of blaming him on that. Yeah. It's important to recognize before we get into the story in detail that the main group that had opposed Jesus to that point in his life were the Pharisees. We've already talked about them quite a bit. The Sadducees, whose lives were pretty constant, much concentrated around events in the temple in Jerusalem, and many of them were priests, had relatively little interaction with Jesus uh, t up to that time. While the Pharisees recognized that resurrection back to life was possible, they believed it was possible, the Sadducees absolutely denied this, that possibility. They believed you have this life, you live it to the full, and when you're dead, you're dead. That was their belief. So Jesus knew when he had traveled to Bethany, let's be very honest here, when he traveled to Bethany a short distance from Jerusalem to visit the family of Mary, Martha, and their uncle Simon, the former leper who was also a Pharisee, that he was about to enter a hornet's nest. He knew that when he raised Lazarus from the dead, suddenly every one of the Sadducees would want him dead. Think that anything? This is unnatural. Yeah. Do you think that had anything to do with his delaying? <laughs> well, well, they were, you got to remember, they were very concerned about their own standing, economic as well as power structure. Yeah. Many of the Jews believed that the spirit, now this is a pagan idea, but they believed it anyway, that the spirit of a dead person hovered around for three days just in case there was some sort of resuscitation. This, of course, was a pagan belief. By waiting four days, Jesus made sure that no one could claim that Lazarus was not dead. And Ellen White tells us that the, the widow of Nain's son and Jairus' daughter, no, they weren't really dead. Jesus read... It was a coma. <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah. And Martha's remarks that there would be a terrible smell was conf confirmation of the fact that Lazarus was indeed dead. Okay, so... It's my turn. Yeah. John eleven seventeen to 27. John 11 is filled with sadness, the sad news of a dear friend's illness, the weeping over his death, the sisters' lament that Lazarus would not have died if Jesus had been present, and Jesus' own tears. Okay. Those of us who believe, as Seventh-day Adventists do, that death is just a sleep, which is what Jesus taught in John 11, recognize that when someone dies, the next she or he knows is the coming of Jesus, whether it's in the first resurrection or the second resurrection. In the story of Lazarus, we come, have clear evidence that Christ has the ability to resurrect people from the dead. From the desire of ages, still seeking to give a true direction to her faith, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath me, 1 John 5, wow. 12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. He that believeth in me, said Jesus, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now, what do you... That's what he said to, to Martha. Yeah, Mary, what, Martha. what do you think she understood by those comments? Speaking of the eternal kingdom. Eternal, Probably, eternal yeah. Life. Christ here looks forward to the time of his second coming. Then the righteous dead shall be raised incorruptible, and the living righteous shall be translated to heaven without seeing death. The miracle which Christ was about to form, perform in raising Lazarus from the dead would represent the resurrection of all the righteous dead. By his word and his works, he declared himself the author of the resurrection. He who himself was soon to die upon the cross stood with the keys of death, a conqueror of the grave, and asserted his right and power to give eternal life. Desire of Ages 530. Okay, here's a theoretical trivia question. How many Sadducees do you think 
was there at the time of Lazarus' resurrection from the dead. Well, it was at a home of, uh, of Pharisees, so they, there might not have been that many. But well, yet they, but were, they were I mean, a prominent family. Yeah, prominent family, no question about that. And it, what this is two miles from Jerusalem, okay, or something like that. And they probably wanted to see what's going on, you know. Well, it's a big, you know, funeral, mourning, and lots of people carrying on, and so forth and so forth. Well. Go ahead. From the Bible study guide. And as God, as the one who created life to begin with, Jesus had power over death. Thus, Jesus uses this opportunity, that is that of Lazarus' death, to reveal a crucial truth about himself. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. John 11. Okay, 20, so what does that mean? It means that final death. <laughs> That final death, yes, of course. Um, and the Bible study guide continues to say, read John 11, 38 to 44. I think we have time to read a few yeah. verses. And it says, what did Jesus do that supported his claim? And it's, it's quoted in the, in the handout. It is? Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. John 11, 38 to 44, deeply moved once more, Jesus went to the tomb, which was a cave with a stone placed at the entrance. And you can go there to the place that they believe was the cave, and you can climb down in it if you want. Take the stone away, Jesus ordered. Martha, the dead man's sister, answered, there will be a bad smell, Lord. He has been buried four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that, um, I'm sorry, didn't I tell that you would see God's glory if you believed? They took the stone away. Jesus looked up and said, I thank you, Father, that you listened to me. I know that you always listen to me, but I say this to the, for the sake of the people here so that they will believe that you sent me. After he had said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And just a trivia question again. How thoroughly were they bound up when they married them? I mean, how could he... How, how could you, anyway. Yeah. Well, you know, when Jesus died, they anointed him with, with perfumes kind of stuff. So didn't they do that with Lazarus? It was an important yeah, person I'm sure. to give maybe preservative things. So maybe he Possibly. wouldn't have smelled that bad in four days if they gave him all these uh, perfumes that, uh, that they presumably gave Jesus when he died. And the next question I want to ask is, okay, Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And think of the crowd. <laughs> what, what are they thinking when Jesus says that? Nothing's Me going to happen. A lot of people didn't believe that it's possible for, Jesus, for anybody to come forth from the dead. There must have been some who thought, this is going to prove all these people are going to know that he's a big phony. Yeah. So read the next verse. Yeah. <laughs> he came out, his hands and feet wrapped in grave clothes and with a cloth around his face, Untie him, Jesus told them, and let him go. Well, they probably wrapped the legs individually so he could walk yeah, even though possibly, he was... Yeah, possibly, yeah. Rather than both legs together, yeah. so he probably could walk. The raising of Lazarus was the crowning act of Jesus' ministry. So many people who were relatives and friends, including Pharisees and Sadducees from Jerusalem, were present for the burial in the morning for Lazarus, that when Jesus performed this miracle and news of what happened, filled Jerusalem almost immediately. What stronger evidence could Jesus possibly provide that he was in fact the resurrection and the life? Unfortunately, this did not produce the results that we might have wished for. Notice the challenge for all who were in attendance at the resurrection. Jim? John 11, 45 to 54. Many of the people who had come to visit Mary saw that Jesus did what Jesus did and they believed in him but some of them returned to returned to the Pharisees and told them that Jesus had done so the Pharisees and the chief priests met with the council and said what shall we do look at all the miracles that this man is performing 
I mean, shouldn't that make you believe him? Right. I mean, this is, so the problem obviously is that they, they see that his influence is going up and their influence is going down. What okay. should we do? Look at the miracles this man is performing. If we do let him go on his way, everyone will believe in him and the Roman authorities will take action and destroy our temple and our nations. And we'll lose our jobs. There you go. One of them names Cal Caliphus. Caiaphas. Yeah, oh, I didn't see it. Does it has an A? I thought it was Caiaphas, but I, it looked like an A or an L, I. Who was high priest that year said, "You fools! Excuse me, what fools you are! Don't you realize that this is better for you to let one man die for the people instead of having the whole nation destroyed?" Actually, he did not say this on his own own account accord. Rather. As he was high priest that year, he was prophesying that Jesus was going to die for the Jewish people and not for only, only for them, but also to bring together into one body all the scatters, scattered people of God. Okay, now I'm going to ask, interrupt for another opportunity. Do you think God inspired Caiaphas to say that? I think he uh, might have had some reasoning capacity. Well, even, even the right? devil tells the truth exactly. at times. Okay. Sure. So the devil inspired Caiaphas to say that. Well, that one, yeah. one should die. <laughs> they, were, one he, should, they were looking out for, the, for their clique, the, yeah. the, the, the hierarchy. Remember okay. in Jeremiah well, it's, it's a true. It's true from both sides. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You Priests wanna, and the prophets are motivated by greed. John, or Jeremiah 6.13. You want to finish reading it there? We, we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to summarize the rest. Okay. Um, let's look at this for a moment. Clearly, that Jesus is, is trying to tell us that he has the ability to give life. That he is he's, he, he's the one who gave us life back in the beginning, the one created all of us. So he has the ability to give us give it back. Um, he, he heals people. He did all these kinds of things. And yet, in spite of all that, uh, some people believed, many did, and I'm happy to say that uh, in Acts 6, verse 7 and Acts 15, verse 5, it says many, when it was all over, many of the scribes, I mean, many of the Great Sadducees problem. and many of the Pharisees actually became believers. So as our physical life is sustained by food, so our spiritual life is sustained by the Word of God. And every soul is to receive life from God's word for himself. That's what we, we believe. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these evidences of the truth as you've presented to us. Help us to know how they should impact us and how we can share this information with others to make that day when you will come again come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.